Okay. Uh, welcome everybody to the second lecture. Um, let me bring it up. So um, this lecture um, is mainly about convex optimization in um, centralized machine learning. You will see the meaning of all those terms. Uh, some, some learning outcomes of this lecture, I'm not sure if we're gonna cover all these items anyway. Uh, but um, the first one is about basic definitions of um, convexity, um, convexity, smoothness, strong convexity, and then what they imply in terms of some, some very important inequalities that you're gonna use in almost all the proofs, some form of them. Um, then, given, given all those backgrounds on convex functions, convex sets, smooth functions, then we're gonna see some deterministic iterative algorithms. So the algorithm that runs iteratively and they are mainly deterministic in all the steps. Uh, they are designed mainly for convex optimization problems, but they can be very well applied to non-convex as well, as we will see in lecture four. Then we're gonna see some connection among them. So cross-connection between these, these iterative algorithms, pros and cons of individual of these items, and finally some convergence analysis. So let's see uh, what we can cover. Okay, we start with uh, the basic, very basic definition of convex set. Well, before that, let's go with, with convex combinations. Um, what is a convex combination of a set of points? Um, even, even before that, I can say the definition of a simplex. Uh, so simplex it is essentially whatever. So the summation of, let's say, xi, which is equal to some constant, we call it simplex. And if this c is just one, then we call it probability simplex. So essentially, these elements are belonging to some probability vectors uh, that's summing up to one, OK? So this is the definition here that you will see. Individual elements should be larger than one. So this is a vector of all one. And this theta is a vector of theta one up to theta n. And if the summation goes to one, we call it probability simplex, okay? Um, convex combination of a point is um, you take any, any of, you take those elements x as some weights, okay? And then form this weighted sum. This is called convex combination of those points, very simple, okay? Uh, but then what does it look like, this convex combination? For two points, if we have this, let's say, x1 and x2, um, theta x1 plus 1 minus theta x2, where theta should belong to 0 and 1. Why? Because the summation of these two should be 1, okay? Well, that, that is essentially 1. Um, so convex combination is any point in this line. By, by sweeping this theta, we can, we can find any points here in this line. So convex combination, it, is like any convex combination would lie somewhere in this line for two points. What does it look like for three points? Um, say this is x1, x2, and x3. Um, for three points, you can make this triangle, and you can make any points here by sweeping this theta 1, theta 2, and theta 3. For example, if you want to make the outcome, so what's the outcome? The outcome is theta 1, x1, plus theta 2, x2, plus theta 3, x3. Okay, uh, if you set theta one equal to one and two and three equal to zero, then you will end up to this point. And then you can change these over a probability simplex to find any point here inside this triangle. Okay, so this is essentially convex combinations. Conic combination is, we're gonna need these definitions later on. So conic combination is similar to convex combination uh, when you drop this line on a probability simplex, that's it. So you will allow this theta one and theta two to be any positive number, okay? Um, then it's gonna look like something like that uh, for any theta one and theta two. And definitely this zero would be inside uh, the set of all conic combinations by setting theta one and theta two equal to zero. Then you're gonna cover this, this um, coordinate. Convex hull is, is actually what I described right here. So it's the set of all convex combination. You are just changing those theta as you can. Um, the, only, the only constraint that you have is this probability simplex. So you're gonna change this theta and the set of all those points uh, that 
we call convex combination, the set of all those points are called convex hull. So for these two points, convex hull is just this line, for three points it's like this, and then in a general case of n points in two dimension, of course you can imagine that for more than two dimension, but for two dimension it's gonna look like that, okay. Uh, convex cone is similar to convex hull, it's just uh, the set of all conic combinations of the points, okay? But then a set is convex if, so for example, if you pick any two points, okay, and then take any convex combination of these two, it should, it should lie in the same set. So definitely this is a convex set and this is a standard uh, example for non-convex set where all the points lying in this red line are not in the set, okay? <clears throat> So by this definition, can we say that convex hull is convex? Well, drop that convex things, but can we say that convex hull is convex? Well, by definition it is, right? Because this is definition of uh, all potential convex combinations of any two points here. Well, actually it's more than any two points. So now if you just restrict yourself to just two points, then any convex combination of those two points should belong in the convex hull. So then convex hull is a convex set anyway. Uh, some norms that are extremely useful, so some general definition of the norms. Norm two, or Euclidean norm, um, called also Euclidean ball, uh, with radius r, oh, okay, with radius r and certain centered at some x c can be like this, so all the points whose distance in terms of norm two is smaller, uh, whose distance with x c is smaller than r, okay? So what does it look like? looks like this. So you have xc and any points whose distance in terms of norm 2 is a smaller, well this is not a circle but it should be a circle. Um, then all the points here is, um, is, is this, this um, Euclidean norm um, or Euclidean ball. Um, you can always show, and it's very easy actually to show, that this definition is equivalent to this definition. So the main thing is that here, you're saying that this is the center, and this is a normalized vector, um, and then showing the direction, and this is the magnitude of that direction. So from this center, you pick some direction, uh, and the magnitude of this direction, so the norm of this direction can be just r, and just sweep this. So all the points that are gonna be sweet up to radius r, um, will be inside that set, okay? Uh, and then the set of all those points are called Euclidean ball. Norm cone uh, is something like that. Um, for, for a general norm, we can define the set of X and R that satisfies this inequality, okay? Um, then, okay, ellipsoid. Um, we're gonna need this definition later on, especially in Newton methods. Um, so ellipsoids are the set of points that satisfy this constraint, but the main difference uh, between this one and this one is that here we can just, um, we don't need to be, uh, this guy here, let's say R1 and this one R2, R1 and R2, they don't need to be identical. So we can have something like that. We can change the geometry a little bit. It's still, we are in the convex regime, so it's a convex set but we can change this R1 and R2 by changing the eigenvalues of this P1, uh, this P. Uh, why is it important? Because it might be just imagine that these two R1 and R2 that I depicted here, these R1 and R2 are say two different, um, two different parameters or um, yeah, two different parameters and you have different importance of different parameters. So you want to form some weighted sum of the loss and then the way that you can put these weights is through that P vector. And if you want to have identical weights, then you can just replace this P with some I metric. So essentially there is no uh, priority in, in any of those parameters and you will end up to Euclidean norm, okay? So just to give you some uh, intel. Uh, Okay, convexity. Now some more definitions of convexity, now convex functions. Um, convex function, um, let me use the other board now. I can write over here, that's perfect. Okay, convex function, the main definition of convex function is if you pick any two points, 
x1 and x2. And if you form any convex combination of these two points, OK, for changing theta, so this is theta x1 plus 1 minus theta x2, OK? Then the, the points evaluated here should be always larger than the actual function point evaluated at the same point. So theta x1 plus 1 minus theta x2, OK? If that's true for all theta and all x1 and x2 of the function, of the domain of the function, then we call it a convex function, OK? You can always see that equivalently, instead of going with this definition, you can define something that I mentioned in the previous lecture called epigraph, uh, which is all the points above this function. And if, if the epigraph of the function, so the epigraph is a set of all those points, so definitely is a set. And if this set is convex, which here you can see, we pick these two points, and any things within this line belongs to that set, right? So if this set is convex, then we can call the function convex. So now, for example, if we say a function like that, then what's the epigraph of this function is like this, right? Now we can pick these two points of that set, and the intersection here uh, is not in the set, right? So the epigraph is not convex, so that's why we can say that the actual function is not convex itself, OK? So uh, <coughs> alternative definitions. Uh, why working with epigraph can be important? Because it's like a duality, you will see that. So either you will work with function or the epigraphs. In some of the proofs, it's much easier to work with the epigraphs. And then show that the epigraphs or intersection of the epigraphs, they are convex. Therefore, the functions are convex. OK, here for the first definition, we don't need to have differentiable functions. But then what would happen if the actual function is differentiable? Then you can show that actually everything will get very interesting in that case. So we can show that for any points like x1, if you draw the line here, the tangent line here, then the whole function would lie in one half a space. So for instance, so all, what does it mean? It means that all the points would be larger than this, this specific line, OK? So uh, this is the actual meaning of this inequality, f of x2 is larger than this one, OK? So essentially, all the function would, would lie in this half space. So why is it important? Because if you can just draw this line, then you can say for sure that half of the, half of the space is not optimal solution. So that's very great. Uh, and then how you can do that? By just some local information. Why? Because this is the gradient of the, the only thing that you need to have to, to draw this you need, to, you need to know x1, and you need to know the gradient at x1 to be able to draw this line, right? And the only thing that you need for those two items, x1 and gradient of x1, is just local information. What is the definition of the gradient? You are finding some epsilon here, and then finding the gradient with respect to this epsilon, at this epsilon. So just local information is just enough to say something globally about the whole function, that the whole function will lie in this half space. So this is a pretty, pretty, uh, Interesting, I would say. Uh, OK. And then if the function is twice differentiable, then we can say something more. So in that case, we can say the Haitian, the Haitian, which is defined like this, so the function is twice differentiable, then the Haitian exists. Then we can say that the Haitian is positive semi-definite. So essentially, it says that the curvature of the function is always non-negative in all x, OK? <clears throat> So these are three different, well, say, three main definitions of uh, convex functions depending on differentiability, first order and second order. Any questions so far? This is if and only if. Um, actually, the, these are dual problems. So if the epigraph is convex, uh, then for sure, if convex set, then for sure the function would be convex. Why it would be convex? That's a question. Why? You can just form this definition. Why? Because it's a convex set, right? So for all the points belonging to that epigraph, we should have this property for all the points. So we shouldn't actually have this property, we should have this property. Uh, 
let me see. Uh, we should have this. Um, we should have this property. So for all the points, here we can. I can show that for all the points. If you draw some line, then that line should should remain in in that, right? So now, if we if we draw this this line, and then we want to see if this function is convex or not, right? So just pick these two points for any points belonging to that. Those points are in, in the boundary of that set anyway, right? Because this is the definition of epigraph. So for any two points, the intersection, any points within should remain in the inside, right? So by definition of being in boundary, that point should be larger than this point, right? So then you are satisfying this inequality here. So this is just basic definition. And you can go from this to epigraph definition as well. <clears throat> so this if and only if. Um, OK, some examples. Just one thing uh, that I wanted to deliver with these examples is that uh, in most of the cases, just to be honest, you cannot use those definitions to check the convexity of the function. Well, you can use always, but it's not good. For instance, if you want to see, just, just show me that um, norm p, in general p, is convex, norm 10. Definitely, you cannot find the derivative of that. It's, it's just very messy. So then you're going to need some other, not definitions, some other techniques that preserve convexity. So the whole thing is that um, I would really suggest to, to check Boyd's book. There are lots of examples there. But then there are some, some very basic uh, operations that if you apply on a convex function, those operations preserve convexity. And this is what we're going to use most of the cases. So uh, we're going to see that some function is, is convex. For instance, we know by definition of norm that any p norm is convex. And then we're going to use that and those form of convex preserving operations to show that this is convex, this is convex, and I don't know, this is convex as well. So the only thing that we need to show, if we want just to directly show that this is convex, it's going to be very hard. But then starting from that and using those convex preserving operations, then that's very easy to show that this is convex or that one is convex. Okay. So we, we, just, we just go to some of those examples. But before that, let's uh, draw this, this p norm. Do you know how p norm would look like in general for some p? Um, let me use this board. We will see uh, the importance of the norm, uh, but uh, later on in, in, in gradient descent algorithm and a steepest descent algorithm. But uh, to give you some flavor of that, um, what does it look like for p equal to 1? Sorry? Uh, yes, so it's going to be something like this. Well, I'm just depicting for two-dimensional. Well, that's not exactly this. So, so this is for p equal to 1. What is for p equal to 2? Then it's going to look like something like a circle, right? What is for p equal to half, to 1 point half? <clears throat> then it's something between these two. You can just, just depict that later on using some software. But it's a bit roundy here. What is for p equal to infinity? So the infinity norm. It's going to look like a square. And what is anything between these two? It's going to be a little bit between this one and that one, so a little bit rounded corners. So these four points, and it's going to be something like this, depending on the norm. And all of them are convex, so something like that. Okay. Just, rec just, just remember the, the shape of these norms. This is pretty important. OK? But then you can show that for all p, the norm p is, is convex. OK. Um, what happens if you say p equal to half? Go ahead. Don't worry. OK, yeah. Uh, if you come inside a, um, yes, but, but is it convex? Is it norm? It's not norm. Because by definition of a norm, it should be convex. And for p half, it's not convex. So exactly. So what, what he said is that for zero norm, it's like this. 
And for half norm is, well, this is not norm, but then say, generalize the definition for P half, then it's gonna look like something like that. Okay, so this one. So this is not convex. But just, just be careful that this is not norm for half, uh, because it's not convex, okay? But it's called pseudo-norm, all those sort of things. Quadratic function, you will see a lot of that, especially in empirical risk minimization and all over machine learning, you will see that. Uh, where you have some form of um, loss functions that somehow penalizes the difference between some labels or some, some values, real values, and your prediction. And then the way that you penalize that is by some quadratic uh, objective function, okay? So in general, it's gonna look like something like that for some symmetric, mat uh, symmetric matrix A. Uh, so this is clearly a quadratic function of X. And then if you take the second derivative of that, it's 2A. So it's convex if and only if A is uh, positive semi-definite, definite. Um, so PSD, uh, that's very easy. What would happen if A is not PSD? So what, there is a one negative eigenvalue for A. Then what would happen? <coughs> How hard is to solve this optimization problem? Let's say minimize this one, just this one, subject to X greater than zero, for instance, whatever like that. Uh, or x belongs to some, some other, other constraint set. So x belongs to c in general, minimizing this guy for dimension of x is one million. Uh, so what is the complexity of solving that? Can you do that? If, x is, if a is PSD. Let's say dimension of x is thousand. Can you do that? So this is, we'll see later, that this is called quadratic programming and it's quite efficient, quite fast to solve. So for 1,000, I would say just half a second or even less than that. Uh, you will not even notice the, the, the time that you're gonna take to solve this and then it's just implemented in all, all programming softwares. Uh, but then what would happen if one of the eigenvalues is negative? Can you, can you do that for 1,000 variables? Just one of the eigenvalues is negative. Exact optimal solution. What about 100 variable? No, you cannot. Because then suddenly the problem from being convex, very well behaved polynomial complexity time, uh, actually is like n cube or even less than n cube. Well, not even n cube, it's even less than n cube. Uh, so very, very nice convex optimization, a strongly convex even optimization, it's gonna be in the class of NP hard problem. Well, not NP hard, but NP problems. So suddenly it becomes with just one negative eigenvalue, it becomes from, it moves from very easy prop class of problems to extremely hard class of problems. Um, and then you're gonna have a lot of tricks like that, just, just neglecting that negative eigenvalue, try to solve this relaxed problem, all those sort of techniques. But it's good to know before just starting to write the code and then defining this objective function, trying to run everything and then seeing why I cannot solve this problem. The other time that I did have this quadratic programming, I could solve it very efficiently for million variables, why I cannot do that for like 100 variables. Uh, it could be due to that, okay? I'm, I'm just saying that it's good to know before, before starting to program, it's just good to know the functions, how it behaves, why you are using this specific software package to do that and to solve this problem. Okay, uh, what about this one? Is it convex or not? Well, I just show you can see that. So uh, it's always convex. Uh, and you don't need to have PSD uh, condition for A. But the other way to show that is just starting from this. So all P norms, in particular norm two, is convex, and any affine transformation of a convex function is convex. So what does it mean? So this is one of those transformations that I have mentioned. So if f of x is convex, uh, then you can conclude that f of ax plus b, in general, this is convex as well. So now, Define f of x as this, and do this transformation. So this, this affine transformation wouldn't hurt the convexity of the function. So then you can directly say that this is convex without even going for second derivative, okay? And then you can say that for any a, it doesn't have to be positive, uh, definite, or PST or anything. 
Uh, what about this? I just mentioned that this is, in general, P. You can use that. Uh, what about this one? How you would show that this is convex? I, I would say that this is convex, but then how you show that this is convex for any P? This is an important for this. You need an important, uh, again, convexity preserving inequality. I would suggest to check all those sort of, all those, those um, functions, uh, let's say operations, and lots of examples. But then here, um, you're going to need this one. So actually, let, let me write another example down. Um, so. Um, max over x belong to some convex set. Well, it doesn't have to be convex anyway. Of um, y transpose x minus f of x, and then call it f of y. OK. Now I'm putting that close to this one. Close to this one. OK. Well, you, well, actually, this can be generalized to sup, supremum. Uh, well, you are using, you can use the same trick to show that this is convex for any f, and it doesn't have to be convex. So f doesn't have to be convex, but it's the f of x, but then this guy, f of y, well, this is not f of y, let's call it f conjugate of y, and this is the definition of conjugate function. But then you can show that this guy, g of y, is convex for all f of x. Uh, but then how you would show that? OK, think about that. Um, in the break, I will tell. OK, uh, this is a pretty important function. Anyway, uh, some other functions like soup here, uh, the same trick can be used here. The projection, uh, the projection essentially, the meaning of that is if you are limited to say that all x should belong to some feasibility set C, and if due to any reasons your, your iterative algorithm finds some other point outside that feasibility region, then the easiest way or the, more nat the most natural things that you would do is just to project that one by some norm to, to the closest point within the set, right? So this is called projection with the general norm, but usually people use norm two here. But so this is the definition. So find within that set the point that has the minimal distance with respect to x. So geograph. So uh, let me see. Uh, this is like okay. Now it's much easier. So let's say that uh, this is your set C, and the point is here. So let's say this is x of k. So at iteration k, you have that. And at iteration k plus 1, you have that. But then you are limited to, to just select points within this set. So that, that thing here, infimum of y belongs to this c of norm of y minus x. So this guy means that project this guy to this set with some norm. If this is like norm 2, then you're going to project and then find this one. And then say this is your xk plus 1 instead of this one, OK? So this is the meaning of that. And this operation here is convex if c is convex. So here we need this condition that if c is convex. Whereas in this projection, um, let me see. OK, whereas here, we didn't have to have convexity of c <coughs> uh, and convexity of f. OK. The way to show that this is convex is really easy. Well, there are lots of ways, but then the easiest one is use those transformation uh, preserving, uh, convexity preserving transformations. Uh, OK. So the trick here, for instance, is that if inf of f of x and y, OK, uh, over, let's say, y belongs to some c. If c is convex, and f of x and y is convex in jointly on x and y, then this is some g of x, right? Then g of x is convex in x. 
So this is the thing. So here you just need to have convexity here, which you do have in, in terms of x and y, and then you need to have uh, convexity of set C, then this infimum, infimum over F is convex. Uh, again, I'm being extremely fast here because there are lots of things to cover here. As I mentioned, convex optimization is something that you need to know. Uh, but then double check this book. Um, just go through that and then see those definitions. Um, some of them quite useful. Okay. Uh, okay, so some more definitions beyond convexity, traditional convexity form. So what would happen if a function is not convex? Are we bounded? Can we say that, okay, we cannot find any solution for that in general? No. Uh, there are lots of other classes uh, that are more general than convexity. So the first one is quasi-convex. Um, so what is the definition of quasi-convex? So let's first define this one as, uh, what is, um, the meaning of that is all the sublevel sets. Uh, so for, for a function, let's say this is a function, okay? Um, that says that if you draw any line, all the points here, so this is x and this is f of x, okay? So this set here is called, uh, okay, let's call it s of alpha sublevel set of alpha. So for any alpha here, f of x is smaller than alpha, the, all the points x for which f of x is smaller than alpha is just all these points, okay? So this is the definition of this set. And uh, we call a function quasi convex if for all alpha, this one is convex, so this set is convex. And if, if that's true, then we have a quasi convex. Um, so one counterexample of this, well not counterexample, a function that is not quasi convex is like this again, okay? And then if you draw these sublevel sets, then the sublevel set's gonna be like this and that, the union of these two. And then this is not a convex, why? Because you can pick one point here and then one point here, and then this point here for some theta, this point is not in that set, right? So this is not convex set. Therefore, this function is not quasi convex. But then one other function that is quasi-convex is like this. Well, that should be a straight line. So something like that. Can, we, can you run, for example, gradient descent here to find the optimal solution? Let's say this one. The thing is that here, if a function behaves like this, then that's very easy. You can just run gradient descent. Well, but you know what's the gradient descent. You can go downhill and then find this optimal solution. But can you do that here? No, boy, because just imagine that this is just zero. The gradient here is almost zero. Then the gradient descent will just stop here, okay? But then if the function is quasi-convex, so this is a quasi-convex function, then what you can do is that you can run bisection. And that's very simple. So bisection essentially says that picks two, po two points, usually the domain of the function, and then just check the intermediate point. And if the intermediate point is smaller, then either go with this section or this section and do this bisection again and again and again. And then you can converge. You can easily show that you can converge with bisection. Okay. So these set of class of functions, they are not. And then you can always show that a, a convex function is quasi convex as well. Um, so here you may not be able to run gradient descent, for instance, but you can run bisection search and easily solve this class of problems. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is an equal definition. Um, uh, of this. So these two are identical, okay? And this is actually the basics of running this bisection search. That's why we can do that. Okay. Um, another generalization of a convexity is log convexity and log concavity. Um, this is essentially a log concave function is a function whose log is convex. So if you take a log of f, so f is not concave, but log of f is convex, concave. Um, so this is very easy log concave function. Why is it important? Because most of the probability densities are actually log concave. So if you do need to optimize something over some probability densities, say probability of something 
being smaller than something in wireless communication, probability of bit error is smaller than something, then that function usually is log concave. And then you can maximize that, OK? Um, so for example, probability of SNR being larger than something, the link quality is larger than something, the probability of um, some classification error or some classification accuracy is larger than something, then all of them are usually log concave for almost all densities. So then you can easily optimize them. Okay, you just need to take a log uh, transformation and then that's it. Um, now you will be in the convex optimization regime. Um, okay, uh, so this is just one example here. And then the last things that we are not covering in this course at all, but actually we are not covering any of them in this course, but just to let you know that these are um, some other generalization of convex function. The last one is majorization and short convexity, which somehow generalizes the definition of convexity instead of being convex on set of points, this is a convexity over sequence. Um, so you want to see that if, if the function, so this is the definition, uh, well there is a definition for majorization, but then if we say that this sequence majorizes the other one, so there is a definition for this. Uh, but then if we say that this is majorizes that one, essentially let's say this is bigger than that one, well bigger is not a good term, just the right term is majorization. Then with short convexity we can say that the function evaluated at that sequence would be larger than the function evaluated at the other sequence. And there are lots of examples here, for, for example, uh, for entropy. Um, in most cases, we can show that they are short convex. And then we can do uh, minimization over them, or maximization over them anyway. Uh, OK. So around the last slides on these general definitions, again, we are super fast on these definitions. Um, so that's OK if you can't get all of those points which is okay because then, then you need to return to the slides and then double check everything, Google some of those terms. Uh, this is a standard form of a constraint optimization problem. Um, and in, in this general form, um, we can have these um, specific examples. These are very specific class of optimization problems for which there are some very efficient solvers. And as we will see later on in the next slide actually, um, most of those solvers are actually calling same solver. So it's not like we have one solver for this and one solver for that. They are all transforming to the same solver and then calling that solver. Um, so this is a general form of optimization, convex optimization in our case. Uh, we call it a linear program if, uh, well, not 2M, if the affine objective, if the objective is affine, so affine is AX plus B for some constant B and constant A. Uh, so some affine function over some affine F and affine H. So these are called, as you can see, inequality constraint and equality constraints, okay? Um, so the set of affine inequality and affine equality is called a polyhedron. And polyhedron is like this. Uh, it's like drawing some lines, okay? And if it is open, then we don't have this equality. So if we don't have equality, it means that all the points should be in the intersection of all those lines. So it's all the points here. Uh, it's called polyhedron. And if we have, so that's going to be an open one, and if you have this equality, it means that there are some of them also that we should be in some of those lines, and it could be closed as well. Of course, it depends on this, this one here that we do have equality or not. But then if you do have equality here, then it's going to be a closed polyhedron. So what does it mean? It means that, for example, optimizing a linear function, which is C transpose x, over this constraint. So this is the meaning. So in this case, what is the optimal solution? It's like this, okay? <clears throat> well, that's very easy to find because it's like two dimension. You don't need to magic solvers. But just imagine that we want to run this over a million variables. Then definitely you cannot visualize. Okay, that's the whole idea of having some solvers because otherwise you can just, just draw everything and then find the optimal solution. Uh, Quadratic program is uh, the objective is quadratic over 
again a fine set of constraints. So a fine f, let's say for sake of simplicity, linear f and linear h. Okay. Quadratic constraint, quadratic programming uh, is QC, QP. Uh, is if this is quadratic and these guys are quadratic as well. And then of course you can see that if it is quadratic, for instance here, if this is quadratic, then you can just um, put some constant in the quadratic term to zero, then you will end up to, to a linear or affine inequalities. So then you can see that this quadratic constraint, quadratic programming is a generalization of this. So if you have any solver for that, then that solver can work with this as well, okay? That's very easy to see. Um, second order clone programming would look like that. So a linear function, a linear objective over a cone. Um, and SDP, semi-definite programming, uh, is optimization problem of this form where you have a linear function over some, um, some positive or non-negative or negative depending on the situation, usually non-negative um, matrix, okay? Uh, so these are general form. We are not talking about them so much later on because most of the optimization problems that we will see in large scale optimization problem especially, they are unconstrained optimization problem. So usually you don't have these guys. But then the thing is that even if you do have them, then there is something called Lagrangian duality where you can just move them to the objective functions and then find a lower bound on the optimal solution. So there is a way to make Unconstrained optimization problem, unconstrained optimization problem, and say something about the optimal solution. Okay, uh, but it's it's always important that you know that there are these class of optimization problems, and a lot of variations of them as well. But then this generally shows the class of optimization problem, at least these guys, and don't worry about these geometric things. Uh, so linear program, quadratic program, second order cone program, SDP and CP and, and GFP and uh, cone programming. So this essentially says that LP is a subset of QP and it's very easy to see why because in QP you have a quadratic term here and just set that quadratic term to zero then you're gonna end up to some linear objective. So whatever solver you have, so if you have a solver for quadratic programming that solver can solve LP. That's why that if you want to build up some, some solver you really don't build anything for linear program, you just build something for quadratic programming plus add some additional line to make sure that this linear programming is transformed to the quadratic programming uh, definitions. Okay, uh, and then you can do that. So that's why that most of the cases we have cone programming or GFP um, and then all other solvers are somehow using those form of transformations for all other examples to make it similar to this form of programming and then call that that, that solver. Okay. <clears throat> You will see. <laughs> you will see. So the question is about why we have so many definitions so far and what's the use of all those definitions. So first of all, we are talking about convex optimization. So even without knowing the application of those definitions, I would say that you need to know the definitions. Um, otherwise, you cannot define a convex optimization problem. So if you want to define, say that this is a convex optimization problem, we should know what does it mean, okay? So convex optimization problem means that the functions are convex and constraints are convex, but what does it mean? Once we want to say this is cone programming, we need to know what cone means, right? And we need those definitions for cones and, and, and um, cone combination of the points and conic set and um, convex hull, 
those things, conic hull, so all those sort of things, we just need to know them, the definitions, just, just to be concrete. But it's not all. Later on, we will see in the second part of the course, uh, this lecture, we will see uh, some of the algorithmic approach to, to, to find the optimal solutions. For instance, one of them is gradient descent and perturbed gradient descent and, let's say, projected gradient descent. And in projected gradient descent, we explicitly use this form of projections here. So the thing is that uh, it could happen that uh, we are limited to find the solution within this feasibility region and the feasibility region happens to be convex, uh, but then there is no guarantee that that uh, stochastic gradient or gradient descent, whatever, which other of them, or any iterative algorithmic solution, they are just running some iteration and they don't have any limitations to say that the next sample, the next x, should be within the set. So it just happens that this, this is outside the set. Then we're gonna need this one to project back that to the set. Uh, and why we need the convexity of these things for the analysis. We need to know that this is convex to be able to do this analysis. Okay, the analysis, I mean the convergence analysis of those algorithms. So uh, don't worry, you will see the, the meaning of all those sort of things later on. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, AI doesn't have to be X. We can have X there, but I'm not sure if we do need, because here we do have X anyway. Ah, uh, conic, yes, yes, it should, uh, yes, it should be X here. <laughs> Otherwise, it just doesn't make sense to have AI plus B. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then, of course, we cannot do this summation. Yeah, there is a things here. And then this M here as well. Okay, so uh, we are a bit behind the schedule. So uh, I guess that this duality is the last thing, is these definitions. Uh, okay, so what is duality? Um, pretty important things. <laughs> so, okay. So define f star, well, there is a parenthesis here missing. Define f star as the optimal solution. So f of zero evaluated at the, the minimizer of the, that function, okay? And define the Lagrange dual function. This is the definition, which is the infimum of this, uh, this, this L function which is f0 plus lambda i multiply. So if, if you look at this optimization problem, I'm just multiplying this guy here by some lambda and then putting that to the objective function, multiplying these guys with some other gamma and then putting them back to, to the objective function, okay? With some nu and then putting that back to the objective function. Um, and then we call it Lagrange dual function, finding the, 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 the infimum of this guy. It's very easy, here you can see the lines, but it's very easy to show that the solution here, okay, is, so for all lambda and v, for all lambda and v and nu, this guy g is always smaller than this f star. So what does it mean? It means that if you can, it just happens that you can easily solve this, nobody will ask what is the value of lambda and nu, nobody will ask. What, for any lambda and nu, if you can solve this very easily, then you have a lower bound, you have a lower bound on the objective function, okay? Uh, why is it important? Uh, we will see uh, in the next slide, okay. But just imagine that for some class of problems, it's really hard to solve the original problem, but it could be easier due to some reasons um, that to solve the dual problem. Actually, we didn't define the dual problem, but this is a dual problem, just imagine. That we can find the solution for the dual problem, then it somehow shows uh, a lower bound and the, the best things that you could go if you could, if you were able to solve the original problem, okay? Uh, and this is pretty, pretty important. Why? Because due to any reason, you cannot solve the original problem, but you know that the, somehow the heuristic solution that you do have is close to the lower bound. So then you're, you're just fine with that solution. You don't need to put so much other effort to, to find the optimal solution, okay? Since we do have this inequality, so we know that this is always smaller than f star, let's try to maximize this guy to close this gap or make this gap smaller. So this is, this is a dual problem, essentially. So finding lambda and nu uh, with this constraint of lambda greater than zero, that uh, this is called dual feasibility. Uh, and these guys are called primal feasibility and dual feasibility. Um, so subject to this lambda, try to close this gap or make the gap as, as close as possible. Why? Because 
Um, it's just OK. We know that this is a lower bound of that, so find the best lower bound. OK? And then uh, we can show that if something called a strong duality uh, holds, then we can say that this inequality will be equality. So the, uh, there is no something called duality gap. So duality gap will, will close to 0. This one minus this one is called duality gap. OK? Um, just to give a concrete example here is consider this, this is a linear programming, right? So this is a linear objective, linear con inequality constraint, and linear quality, uh, equality constraint. So this is a primal. You can easily show that the dual of this, op this optimization problem is like this one. And in this specific case, duality gap is 0. But don't worry about that. This is not the main idea. The main idea is that here, uh, it could happen that A is tall, very tall matrix, OK? And just imagine that uh, for any row of A, so any row of A is just one constraint, right? So just imagine that for any constraint, you need to have one unit of communication. So we are talking over optimization of this guy over some form of networks. So for any row, you need some form of communication. Then what would happen is that instead of solving this guy, you can try to solve this dual function. And here, you just have A transpose. So the number of constraints that you do have here is usually much, much smaller than the number of constraints that you do have. So by this very small trick, you could, what you can do is that you may be able, not in all scenarios, but in this specific scenario, you, can, you, you may be able to reduce the communication overhead by just looking at the dual of the optimization problem instead of the primal one. Um, there are lots of, lots of things related to that, like weak and strong duality, constant qualifications, and all those sorts of things. Again, you can just, just check Boyd's book for, for all these definitions. So any questions so far? Here. Uh, usually we don't need to have. Uh, we need that for something uh, to have these thing holds and to have these KKT conditions and complementary slackness. <clears throat> uh, why we don't need that? Can you say? Because if, that's, if the solution is primal feasible, then H is 0. Then it just doesn't matter what is new. OK? This is the definition of a strong convexity. It essentially says that the function can be somehow lower bounded with this by some uh, by some uh, quadratic form. So what does it mean? If you remember the definition of, um, let me show it right here. Oh, we're going to need this, I guess. So let's assume that this is your function, OK? Um, convexity says that, and just assume for sake of simplicity that everything is differentiable, OK? So convexity says that if you pick any point, then you can draw a line. Well, just imagine that this is your function. You can draw a line, and the whole function would be above this line, OK? Would be in this half a space. What a strong convexity says, so this definition of convexity, a strong convexity says that now instead of drawing a line, you can be a little bit more ambitious and then draw a quadratic function here. And then the function would be on that half a space drawn by this quadratic function. So this is essentially the meaning. So what does it mean? It means that it will, the curvature here is now way better than a linear function. OK. Um, so just saying that, say, this is, this is your function, f of x. OK. This is from convexity. It says that at this point, for example, you can draw a line and then make sure that the function is above this line. This is a strong convexity. And the curvature of this guy is something called, called mu. Okay? So strong convexity, let's say mu is strongly convex, it means that everything going to be uh, above this, this line. Okay? We're going to need that. This is something called, we will see in the next slide, but this is from a smoothness. And we say that. And then the curvature of this, this curve is L. Then we call it L a smooth function. So there is an upper bound. So everything will be like between these to the function will be between this lower bound and that upper bound if you do have a strong convexity and a smoothness. And this is, this is the main. Uh, 
geometric interpretation that you're going to need for most of the proofs. Okay? So main intuition, as I mentioned, linear lower bound with convexity, quadratic lower bound, this one, with a strong convexity. Um, you, this is global definition because you should have that for all x within the domain of the function, but you can define local strong convexity as well. We will see that in Newton methods, where all the functions are um, locally, um, they do have locally quadratic lower bound. Okay. Um, mm, and don't worry about subgradients. You will see that the definition later in some, some uh, optional slide. Uh, it's just a generalization of the gradient. So whenever you have this one, you can just replace this. If the function is not differentiable, you can just replace that one with subgradients, and then everything would work. This is a bit generalization of the gradients. Okay, don't worry about that. Um, okay, the first homework, first part of homework one here. So um, these are well. Um, this is um, okay. Let's say. Four, if the function is twice differentiable, we can say that four is equivalent to a minimum positive curvature, this guy, okay? Uh, what we could say with uh, convexity is that there is a non-negative curvature because the lower bound is just a line. But with, with this, we can say a positive curvature, essentially something like this, which is pretty important. It says that everything converges much faster now to the optimal solution. So because we do have a better curvature here of the function. Um, you can always show, and this is something that you will show in homework one, that this is equivalent to that, okay? And this, well, all these three are equivalent. Also, we can show that this definition of a strong convexity implies all these four inequalities. And all of them are pretty important, in particular the first one, actually. This is, this is you will see in almost all the proofs. Also this one, well, all of them, <laughs> you will see. Um, this one, in particularly, if f is convex and r is strongly convex, then the summation is going to be strongly convex. Um, the proof is just easy, just the definition of convex and a strong convex, and you can show that. But what is the implication? Just imagine that R is some form of regularization, a strongly convex regularization, or like ridge regression, where you have norm two here, and some convex function f. That's enough. So just one of them should be strongly convex for the whole function to be strongly convex. And then uh, that's it. You, then the convergence rate that you can have is much, much better than the convergence that if you didn't have that strongly convex term. So very simple trick that um, you can use here. Uh, <clears throat> so the homework is just to prove everything here. Any question? But nothing more to say here because you're going to prove. Um, and finally, the final definition that we're going to need for the first part is a smoothness. Um, I have already mentioned that a smoothness means that essentially we can have an upper bound, a quadratic upper bound on, on the function at any point. Uh, so if I return this guy, it says that this function at this point will somehow have some quadratic upper bound and then the curvature of this upper bound is L, a smoothness parameter. <clears throat> Uh, so this is what I just said. So the difference of the function, just imagine that this x1 is uh, the previous iteration and this is the next iteration of your algorithm. So this difference cannot beat a quadratic function for some L. L could be very large anyway, but then essential or very small, depending on that we will see uh, what would be the convergence rate if L is a small versus L is large. We will see that. But then there is a quadratic upper bound on that, on that change, OK? And then there are implication of the quadratic. Um, so um, this is just, just to just recall, this is definition of uh, smoothness, L is smooth function. And this is the definition of a strong convexity. So you can see the signs. So this difference is somehow upper bounded by this L and lower bounded by this. OK, uh, just to give you a point to point comparison. And then these are the implications of uh, a smoothness. These are pretty important ones, especially the first one. 
um, you will see in almost all the proofs, and especially in the development of the Newton methods, you will see that we're going to use this one for smooth functions. Uh, but then uh, you will see the use of all those sort of things, these, these inequalities in almost all the proofs. Uh, so that's why that this is the part B of your homework, to prove these inequalities. Uh, OK, uh, we can have five minutes break, I guess.